Hello, and welcome to today's thoughts and our reading. In a few minutes, I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 7. First, I'd like to set the scene from chapter 6. The church was continuing to grow, and its leaders felt distracted from their mission by all sorts of administrative matters, which they were having to do, which, which they felt could be done by others. And so they decided to delegate and appointed a group of other dedicated followers to do these tasks. A man named Stephen was one of these people. In chapter 6 we read that Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miracle, miraculous signs among the people. Something which obviously didn't endear him to the powers that be. We're told that he stirred up the people. The Stephen was seized and brought before the Sanhedrin, where he was accused of saying that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I read to you the first few verses of chapter 7. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even ground to set his foot upon. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they would come to, out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering and our ancestors couldn't find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in a tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord. Now, ten days ago, on Friday, April the 15th, I did something I rarely do. I watched daytime TV in the morning. The reason being that it was the day we commemorated the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. The day on which the Second World War finally ended. And there was a wonderful commemoration at the National Arboretum. Now, we tend to forget that August the 15th is really the day when hostilities ceased and men and women could breathe a sigh of relief. And I am ashamed to say that it never really occurred to me before, and yet my father was out there, far away from home in Ceylon. To these women and families whose loved ones were still fighting in Asia, VE Day must have been an anticlimax. And one of the commentators this year described how those returning from the Far East felt as though they'd been forgotten by the rest of Europe. <clears throat> Perhaps people wanted to forget because of the way that part of the war ended with the dropping of the atomic bombs. 
And then I learned an important fact that I'd never before known. It was estimated that despite the huge army, which was from over 40 countries building up in the Pacific area, the war could have continued for another 18 months or so before Japan was truly defeated. It wasn't in the Japanese psyche to surrender. They would have fought to the last man, and this would have resulted in tens of thousands more lives being lost. And so the dreadful decision was made to end it once and for all. I've always believed that to understand our present, we need to know something about our past. And I think this is what Stephen was seeking to show to those to whom he spoke on what was to be his last day. His impassioned speech, of which this is only a third, is a summary of how God prepared the way for Christ to come. He begins at the beginning with Abraham, the patriarch who left everything he knew in the land of the Chaldeans to journey as God instructed <clears throat> with nothing but God's promises of land for future generations. God gave Abraham and his people the covenant of circumcision to mark them out as the people of the one true God. He gave Abraham a son, Isaac, despite the age of Abraham and Sarah. The next generation Jacob was born. He became the father of twelve sons. Joseph was the youngest and because of the jealousy of his older brothers, Joseph ended up in Egypt, where unexpectedly he prospered and was later able to save his family when famine struck. In all these strands in the story of God's people, his hand could be seen. Abraham was faithful to a faithful God. Jacob was a weak man who spoiled his youngest son, who was himself a prey to his own vanity, as we read in the story of his multicoloured coat. The brothers reacted in callous and wicked ways in their envy. And yet, God continued to be faithful to them and to lead them back to the path he had chosen for them. And so we will hear over the next few days the pattern continued of God's people letting him down and he picking them up and rescuing them again and again until, of course, the time came for the ultimate rescue in Jesus, who they mostly rejected. The Jews had developed into a people for whom God's law was of paramount importance. They seemed to forget that theirs was a God who led, promised, kept those promises and enabled them to grow and learn. He is a God who has, a, has created a vibrant and changing world for us to enjoy. There's a difference between tradition and stagnation. If we only worshipped in a fixed traditional fashion, then I wouldn't be doing this now. But we do need to be aware of our history so that we can understand change and recognise where wrong has been done and mistakes have been made. The Jews seem to have been a very blinkered people by the time of Jesus, stuck in immovable tradition for its own sake, lacking the freshness and vitality that Jesus brought to faith in God. Our world today seems to be in a time of great change and turmoil. In recent months, we've needed to look a fresh we've needed to take a fresh look at aspects of our history with the explosion of news concerning Black Lives Matter. Are we responsible for acts committed by our forebears? In particular, I'm thinking of the regrettable place that this country has played in the slave trade. I recall that the church where I worshipped in Liverpool for several years had been built, so I was told, in the late 18th century by a merchant who'd made his money from the slave trade. He built this church so custom had it to make amends. Can anyone make amends for the destruction of probably thousands of lives? Only God can know if that person truly repented of his sins. But we could say that God has used his wealth to good effect and he has brought good out of evil by building a church for his people now. What we do need is to recognise the value of human life. 
the right of everyone to live in safety, with food, clothing and a home to call their own. I could weep when I see the little boats of desperate people who are now crossing the sea, not the Mediterranean, but the English Channel, because they believe that we will welcome them and provide a better life. The world is full of problems and difficulties at this time and our one great advantage is that we know we have God beside us. None of us can answer the question that, we be, that may be uppermost in our minds. Why does he allow these things to happen? If you have the answer, please put it on a postcard and send it to me. Suffice it to say, that from the time of Abraham, God has been planning and leading his people. We shouldn't worry, because he is a faithful God. Now, in the words of the song, Faithful God, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord of all, I depend on you. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. So let us pray. God of peace and calm, watch over us in times of struggle. When everything seems against us, when we feel we are letting ourselves down and not doing justice to you, Take our cares on your broad shoulders and bring to us the focus to do your will and cast our worries aside. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ.